There deep conviction there, wasn't it? Whoa. Uh, by the way, we have some folks, uh, Pastor George from India and some of his family uh, members are here. Why don't y'all just stand up over here? Let's give them, a, there they are. Look, over this way. Give them a hand of appreciation. Glad that you're here. All the, yes, praise God. <clears throat> you know, he, he told me his first name, but then he said George. I said, I'm gonna have to go with that. George, that's a lot easier. So, well, if you have your Bibles, we're gonna go to Ephesians and uh, look towards our text, The Church That Thrives. This is part two, by the way. We looked at part one last week. So this is part number two, The Church That Thrives. You know, last week I shared with you that really when you think about a church that thrives, we ask the question, what does it look like? You know, and we have mega churches. As a matter of fact, we have mega churches in our area, all over the state of Florida, all over the country. There's mega churches. All over the world, there's mega churches. But as I shared with you last week, and I, I, listen, I, I thank God for mega churches that are preaching the Word of God and reaching people for Jesus. I am glad about that. But I want to tell you just because a church may be a large sized church doesn't mean it's spiritually where it needs to be. I shared last week that a church can be a mile wide, but an inch deep. Remember that statement? I also just want to say to you, I didn't say this last week, but I, but I also want to say to you that <clears throat> you can have, listen, a thriving church regardless of the style of worship. Am I right? Some of you don't believe that. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, listen, whether you have traditional worship or whether you, listen, have contemporary worship, listen, God loves both styles of worship. And he can come right there in the midst of that worship and show up. So we have to be very careful that we, we don't identify certain things or exuberance or how we worship or what we do to be a thriving church. I, I think that's so critical. And by the way, how many of you know that you can be a busy church and not be a thriving church? As a matter of fact, I want you to look at these words to, through John, the apostle that came from Jesus, to this particular church, notice what he says. Revelation. He says, notice to the angel of the church in Sardis write, who is the angel of the church? Jesus. You're not going to believe this, but it's the pastor. <laughs> because the word angel means messenger. In all the commentaries I read to the messenger of the church in Sardis, and uh, I know you'll have a hard time believing that I'm an angel, don't feel bad about that. Pam also has a hard time believing that. <laughs> okay. So these things he says, notice who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, the number seven, the number of completion. Notice, I know your works. He knows you and me, by the way. That you have a name that you are, what does he say? That you have a name within your region that you are alive, but you are dead. Whoa, what an indictment. But you are dead. Be watchful then and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. So all I'm trying to tell you is many times we look at a particular characteristic of a church or churches and we think that is a thriving church. But the bottom line is, what does the Bible have to say about a thriving church? That's really the key because again, it's not the size of a church. It's not the wealth of a church. I want to stress that. But it does have to do with the theological, the doctrinal truth that that church is preaching and are they practicing what they profess to believe? So very critical. So this morning, I gave you several things last week, but this morning I'm gonna give you five key additional truths that really point to a thriving and a healthy church. As you know, we believe the Bible is the inspired, the inerrant, the infallible Word of God. So in honor the Word of God for those who can. Would you please stand with me as I read our text out of the book of Ephesians, chapter number four, verse number 11. Verse number 11 in chapter four of Ephesians says, and he gave, no, he gave these gifts, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and the teachers. Many of their Greek scholars say that the word shepherd and teacher really kind of goes together. The shepherd is also a teacher. But notice why he gives these. He says, to equip the saints 
for the work of the ministry, for the building of the body of Christ, until, notice, we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, notice, to mature manhood, to the measure of the statue or the fullness of Christ. Why does he do that? So that, notice, he says, so that we may no longer be, notice, children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every single wind of doctrine that comes along. See? He says, no. He says, that's not the purpose. He says that we're carried away by all these different doctrines. He wants us to be built up by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up, notice, in every way, notice, into him who is the what? Into Christ, from whom the whole body, the body is another metaphor for the body of Christ, the people of God. Notice the body of Christ joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is doing its working properly, it makes the body grow up so that it builds itself up. And what does he say? Well, may the Lord bless the reading and preaching of his word as you're being seated. So I'm going to give you several things this morning. And uh, I, watched, I, I will watch the clock, but I, I, I don't know how I'll watch it, but I'll watch it. I'll watch it. So. But I do want to share several things about a thriving, healthy church. By the way, just in case you missed this, <clears throat> do not miss next Sunday. Do we have an election coming up in the next few I am not going to deal with the candidates, but I am going to deal with the issues. Yes, you need to know the issues because how you vote and who you vote for and the issues, listen to me, it affects who we are as a nation and as a church. So more about that next Sunday. So uh, maybe I've said enough just to get you back here next Sunday. So, well, what about, what did we just read? Number one, notice this, a thriving church requires having proper leadership. Would you not agree with me that leadership is absolutely critical? Yes. I've mentioned this before to you that John Maxwell, who was a pastor for many, many years, who does leadership seminars, says everything rises or what? Falls on leadership. So very critical. So it says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers. Notice the reason he gave these gifts. You see, he gave and raised up gifts within people. To do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building of the body of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have time to get into apostles, and there's various uh, interpretations. What is an apostle? The word apostle actually means one who is sent. Apostolos, maybe you've heard that Greek word. One who is sent. Some see them as missionaries. Some see them as those who have unique gifts to minister to leaders within churches. But we won't get into that too much. So just simply say that's the different interpretations. Prophets. Prophets can be someone who stands and proclaims the truth, but also someone who may have a word for the church or a word from the Lord to share with the church. And then there's evangelists. We have, you know, there's few evangelists. Richard Geeson is probably our church evangelist. Man, he goes down there on Lido Beach and he takes a cross and everywhere he can go and he preaches the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we have shepherds and teachers. And they, I said that word is oftentimes combined by Greek scholars. The pastor is the shepherd who oversees the flock, who teaches See, one of my main responsibilities is what I'm doing this morning, teaching you the word of the living God. So now, if that's true, if a thriving church requires having proper leadership, doesn't it make sense that the Bible does give qualifications for those who serve as shepherds and pastors within a church? Matter of fact, let me give you this very quickly. Paul writing to Timothy says this, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, by the way, I'm a bishop too. I'm a bishop. Yeah, that's a, well, well, what is a bishop? He's simply an overseer, you know. He's one who oversees a flock. I do that with a group of elders. We oversee. Matter of fact, the word bishop and elder and some of these words are used interchangeably. But it says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, 
sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. By the way, that needs to be stressed today, I think, in, in the pastoral ministry. But gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Notice one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. A novice is someone who's brand new in the faith. That is, he hasn't been a believer very long. Not a novice. Not less being puffed up with pride. Notice he fall into this, the same condemnation as of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, those outside the church, lest he fail in reproach, notice fall into reproach, and the snare of the devil. That is, now remember, a lot of churches weren't large churches back then. They met in houses at first, right? You didn't have a lot of church buildings. We saw last week where they went to the temple. But so if you're a smaller congregation, you have a bishop, you're known for about people in the area. So they know who the reputation of the person is. So these are some of the qualifications. Also, I think I gave you Titus, did I? I can't remember if I left. Uh, yes. Okay, Titus, notice, for this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I've commanded you. If a man be blameless, there's the word blameless again, the husband of one wife. Now, let me just point out, there's different interpretations of the husband of one wife. The New American Commentary put out by the Southern Baptist Convention says it is somebody who is not a womanizer, someone who is not flirtatious is one interpretation. The other one would be one, a man who's been married only once, but that's, that's debated in the theological circles. Having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. For a bishop must be, again, blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not gritty. Notice, for money, but hospitable, lover, what is good, sober-minded. Notice, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word that he has been taught. So he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort Notice, and convict those who contradict it. Now, I can't again elaborate on all this, but let me just kind of mention a few key words that I think he's talking about. Number one, I think he's talking about integrity. He is talking about integrity from the man who leads the church. Because listen, you're looking at me, right? I mean, I'm your senior pastor, I'm your shepherd. And so I've got to have integrity because if I don't have integrity, what does that do to who I am and my reputation and how I'm preaching from the pulpit? A man has to have character and integrity in his ministry. By the way, I don't want to mention too much of this, but I am absolutely devastated that many pastors over the last several years have had a major spiritual fall and they're no longer in the ministry. The word blameless doesn't mean sinless. Ask my wife. <laughs> but it means this, that, you know, there's not accusations against him, you know, of being ungodly and being a person who is not consistent in his life and his faith. Also, maturity. We talked about, again, maturity. It talks about that he needs to be able to teach is what it says here in this text. Notice in Titus 1.9, he mentioned several things. I think I have them underlined. Sound doctrine. He's able to both to, do, to teach sound doctrine, exhort, convict those who contradict it. So one of my responsibilities is dealing with teaching you sound truth and also those who contradict truth who may have heretical teachings, I, I have to be able to defend that truth. So maturity is very critical. Notice 1 Timothy 3, 6, not a novice. Not a novice. That is, you need to have something under your belt. You need to be a seasoned man of God before they place you in the pulpit. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, R.T. Kendall used to tell me, said that one of the worst things that can happen to a young pastor is for him to be promoted before his time. Yes. See? So you have to be really careful here. A seasoned kind of a person is what he's really referring to, not a novice. As a matter of fact, you know what I really believe? I believe that every man of God, every, every young pastor, it ought to be mandatory for them to serve under somebody for at least three years, being mentored at least three years, maybe five. 
I can tell you it's not going to hurt him. I was two years as a youth pastor, but I did a little of everything. I was a youth pastor. He had me visiting hospitals. I was promoting revival meetings. He had me doing all kinds of things, but he was a real mentor to me. His name was Bud Winstead, uh, that I love dearly, wonderful man of God. And then you need stability. Notice stability in, in his personality and characteristics of the man. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, Good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy of money, gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. That is, I, I just think of the word stability. Again, if I'm going to stand here and be your pastor, ladies and gentlemen, I need to have these things. Am I perfect? No. But there needs to be a consistency. Do you understand what I'm saying? There needs to be a bent and a consistency in these things in my life. In the life of every other pastor also. Now, question. So we're talking about maturity and stability. Would you prefer to have surgery by a surgeon who just got out of medical school or by someone who's been practicing surgery for many years? What would be your choice? <laughs> you know, sooner or later, we're going to have to get our tax preparation ready, right? Right? Now, would you rather have a guy just out of accounting school or somebody who's been doing it for several years? Because they can do, listen, if they're not ready, they can do one or two things. They can either keep you from spending too much money or giving too much money back to the government, or they can keep you from having the IRS knock on your door. Amen? Amen. I mean, what do you want? You want somebody experienced. Same thing related to a pastor, a thriving church. Has to be good leadership. Listen to me. Not only of the senior pastor, but of the staff, of those in leadership, and those of elders, and those who are Sunday school teachers, right? Any key position of leadership. These things, by the way, everybody should have the characteristics of the pastor that he gives, but not everybody does. Sadly, but everybody should have. So don't use that as an excuse and say, well, I'm not a pastor, so I don't have to do those things. No, no, listen, that is the characteristics and the attributes that he leads pastors to have when you're looking for a pastor. So, so very, very, very critical. Now, so, so number one, I'm speaking about authority here, and I, I just think that's so very critical as far as who you put in a pulpit. Uh, why is it so critical? Because listen to me, it's not... Your church, you are the church. It's not a building. It's not my church. It's not the elders' church. Listen, whose church is it? It's his church. Amen. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he is the head of the church. A couple of scriptures. Rather, our main text said, speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in every way into him who is the head. Notice, into Christ. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet, speaking about the, the Lord Jesus, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, etc. Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. So I submit to him. Our leadership submits to him, see, because it's really his church. And that's why it's so very critical to make sure you have the right leadership leading the church. Number two, a thriving church is continually equipping the saints. Equipping the saints. Notice again in our text, verse 11 and 12, and he gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip. That means to build up, to strengthen, to bring edification to the saints. Who are the saints? You. <laughs> The saint, the word saint simply means one set apart. You have been set apart for Christ. You belong to him. You're no longer your own, amen? You belong to the Lord Jesus. So my responsibility and the, of those, the leaders in our church are to build up, strengthen, strengthen, that is, the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple of things about this I want to say. Equipping is intentional. It's intentional. For example, if I'm going to get in shape physically, I've got to be intentional about that. Do you remember my body elastics? <laughs> Do you remember those stretching bands that I introduced you to? Do you know where they are? <laughs> They're in a beautiful bag 
in the corner of my bedroom. But wait a minute. I've not given up. I want you to know. I go to the gym twice a week, and I have graduated from the elastic bands, and I'm doing bench presses on the machine, tricep pushdowns, lap pulldowns. I do this abdominal thing. Hey, you wouldn't believe that my, that underneath, un, underneath my protein is steel. <clears throat> you can't see it yet. You can't see it yet, but uh, underneath, I know there's a six pack that has to be there, Pam. <clears throat> I mean, she is absolutely amazed at what's happened the last five months. Aren't you, Pam? I wasn't very encouraging. Yeah. But, but I'm exercising intentionally because, listen to me, I know that if I'm going to get in shape physically, you know, that I have to go to the gym. I didn't want to go to the gym yesterday. I'm tired. But I went to the gym and I worked out there and uh, had a good workout. It has to be intentional. Equipping the body of Christ just doesn't happen. We can't just simply meet and all of a sudden we grow up and we're developed and we're who we need to be. No, we need intentionality is what I'm speaking about here in this area. Equipping is biblical. We've been talking about, we just saw the scriptures. Listen to me, if we're gonna be the church that God has called us to be, we have to equip, build up, strengthen the saints that the Lord God sends our way. Equipping also is relational. Listen to me, that's why we're encouraging you to get involved in a Sunday school class. <laughs> because, listen, we all need equipped. You may have something to offer in that class. Somebody may have something to offer to you. And here's what I'm saying. Next Sunday, we'll have a challenge over the next three weeks. Just three weeks, that's all I'm asking. Just three weeks. I wish I could cook you breakfast, but I can't. You know, to, to get you there earlier. Three weeks, there is coffee over there. Some classes may have goodies. Does any of the classes have goodies on Sunday morning? Yep, yep you do. What'd y'all have this morning, sir? Karma rolls, Karma rolls that Emily made. You're not talking about those real thick, chewy, icy. Oh my goodness. I'm going to your class next week. Hallelujah. <laughs> But what I'm saying here, listen, how, how do you, you got to build relationships because people need you, you need them. You may not think that, think so, but you really do need one another. So I'm asking you, just try it for three weeks. Meet some friends, you know, and if you go to one class and say, well, that's not my cup of tea, go to another class. Maybe that's your cup of coffee. You know, just, just try the different ones. I think it's gonna be helpful for you to do that. And then also equipping is continual. Listen, we have worship service every single Sunday. We have Wednesday night services. Every week we have Wednesday night Bible studies. We have things happening all over this campus. We have small groups and then we have Sunday school in the mornings. So we have all these opportunities and we're doing it continually. We don't just do it once a year, twice a year. Why? Because listen to me, every single one of us needs to be edified on a continual basis. So, so very critical, continually. And then equipping a kid, of course, is also not only relational, it's correctional. Did you know that? Let me just show you a scripture here. Talking about equipping is correctional. Scripture says, 2 Timothy, but you must continue the things that you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and from the childhood, from childhood that you know the holy scriptures. He's talking to Timothy here. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. Notice through faith, which is in Jesus Christ, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Noted it is profitable for doctrine, for what you believe and teach, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Last week I gave you this scripture. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing of his kingdom. Preach the what? The word. Be ready in season, out of season. Convince, 
rebuke, exhort with long suffering and teaching. So one of my responsibilities in the leadership of the church is to make sure we have correction that is happening if we have heretical doctrine or unsound biblical teaching, if it's not, if it's not sound biblical teaching. Number three, a thriving church understands the need for spiritual maturity. I use Canva to find my pictures once in a while and I found some of these vegetables here. Notice. Now, question, let me, let me see. Let's have an educational time here this morning. Is a tomato a vegetable or a fruit? fruit. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> I thought it was a vegetable. Actually, they say it depends. Because I guess because they will produce a little blood of a, a bud of a flower, they'll say maybe it's a, it's a fruit. But then way back in 1800 and something, I, I read because they were using vegetables and all kinds of cooking and dicing them up, they call it, you know, the tomatoes, they call them vegetables. But here's the bottom line. We expect fruit or vegetable, whatever you want to call that little guy, tomato, we expect them to ripen, do we not? Well, you see, God expects you and I to ripen and grow to maturity in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, my daddy used to cook, fry, he used to fry green tomatoes before frying green tomatoes was ever a big deal. How many of y'all ever had fried green tomatoes? Ooh. How many of y'all ever had green tomato gravy? I thought y'all Christians in here, man. What's going on? I, I thought you were spirit filled. My daddy made the best green tomato gravy and red tomato gravy, and he was very, very good. Well, and so, so we expect things to change in that area, what I'm saying. Also, uh, let's see, I think I have one more little deal there. Do I not? Yeah, grapes, grapes. I love grapes. But you know, I've noticed that I want my, you know what we do now? Pam, can we tell this, what we do to grapes? We, op we open the bag and we see if it's firm, nice and tight, right? I don't want a mushy. Am I right? <laughs> but here's the bottom line. We expect fruit to grow and to develop and to mature into what it's supposed to be. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. God expects you and I to grow. And listen, we must not take this assignment lightly. We really should not. This is a big deal to God. It really is. Because we live in a culture now, people don't know their right hand from their left, up from down. They have no idea. They're so confused. They're wondering what is true, what's not true. And we'll talk about that more next Sunday. But all I'm, all I'm speak, specifically saying is we need to grow spiritually. The Bible says, and here's where I think the church is today. When I say church, I'm talking about many mainline denominations today. My people are destroyed for lack of, what does it say? You see, listen, we have a generation that is being raised. They do not understand the scriptures. They are not biblically literate. And you see, so I'm going to do my very best to make sure you understand what the Bible has to say. Man, I don't want you to be wishy-washy on what the scripture clearly has to say. Man, you don't need to be vacillating just because the culture changes or the government changes a position or some university changes a position. The word of God does not change, period. So again, we need to understand that it's so very critical that we are equipping you theologically with correct truth. Notice again what the Bible says. We read this in our main text. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, that is growing like Christ, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, why does he want us to mature, he tells us? So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro. Watch this, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine that comes along. What I'm trying to say, you need to know what you believe and why you believe it. You see, we don't believe in universalism. What is that? You see, we need to know those kind of things. There's some denominations that says, you're already a child of God. You just have to understand that's, that you are, that you're going to get to heaven regardless of what you believe. That's not what my Bible says. So again, very critical, our belief system and what the scripture says. And listen to me, within our Pentecostal charismatic movement, spirit filled, whatever you want to call the movement of the spirit of the last many generations, here's what I've noticed. All these little waves of stuff comes along. And we need to be mature and solid knowing that everything we're preaching and teaching and practicing is based on the infallible word of God. Peter wrote this, for this reason, I will not be negligent 
to remind you always of these things. Listen to me, truth, even simple truth, we need to be reminded of. We can never get enough of basic truth is what I'm saying. Notice what he says. This is Peter, he says this again, to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. He says, you already know these, but I gotta remind you. He says, yes, I think it right. He says, as long as I'm with you, I'm in this tent, his body being a tent, that is his physical body, to stir you up by doing what? Reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, that is I'm gonna die, just as God, the Lord Jesus, showed me. Moreover, that is Jesus told him he's gonna die, right? How, was, how, did Peter die? how did Peter die? But what is the tradition? How did he die? Crucified upside down. They say they were gonna crucify him right side up, but he said he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord. So I don't know that, that's a tradition. Bottom line is, he says, when I die, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease, after that I die. So, very critical. Now notice, great truths of the Word of God. Here's what I would say. Great truths of the Word of God can never be mastered. And you listen to me, they can never be overlearned. Listen, I, I, just like, I like hearing sermons on grace. I like hearing sermons on faith. I like hearing sermons on the blood of Jesus. How many of you, right? We love to hear the word of God, major cardinal truths repeated again and again. Peter says, therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word of God that you may, what does he say? Notice again, the word of God is connected to our spiritual edification and growth. If we're gonna grow spiritually, we've gotta saturate, listen to me, we have to saturate our minds and our hearts with the word of God. I'll be glad when I got my dissertation project done because I really wanna study some other things. Right now I can't, I'm kind of on a deadline. But studying the word of God, absorbing the word of God, reading the word of God, memorizing the word of God is so very critical. Now, why is spiritual maturity so very critical? I'm gonna give you some quick reasons. Number one, little sub point, because of the susceptibility of our human nature. My friends, you listen to me. We need to be careful the susceptibility of our human nature, what we may be bent or inclined to do. You see, think about it. Adam and Eve were created in innocence, without sin, and placed in a perfect environment. And the tempter came, and they still sinned. I'm just telling you, be careful. Here we have a sinful nature, be careful. The Bible says this, no temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it if you're spiritually mature in the Lord. See? So very critical that we are built up in our faith. Also, another reason why we gotta be spiritually mature, mature is because of this, this godless culture we're living in. The Apostle Paul, you know this scripture, so we've used it so often. I beseech you by the mercies of God, he says, notice that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says, it's because you belong to Jesus, my friend, it's reasonable that you, that you give your body for the Lord, right, what you do. Do not be conformed to this world. That's a, literally says, the Greek scholar tells us, it says, stop being conformed to the world. Do not allow this world to shape you and your ideology. Say. Yes. So he says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing, the building up, the transformation of your mind, that you may prove what is good, what is acceptable, what is the perfect will of God. We need spiritual maturity because we live in a culture that has gone haywire spiritually. So very critical. Denominations are in really bad shape. Also because of the attack of the enemy. How many of you know that the enemy is going to attack you and me? We got a target on our backs. You see, again, he's going to come against us, the Bible says, so that we no longer be children. The text that we read, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but notice by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. 
And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, but I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so that your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If you were walking down a jungle-looking path and you encountered this creature, creature what would you think? I don't know what kind of a snake that is, but I can tell you this much. If I see that thing any near me, I'm going the other direction. What about you? My friend, he is a slithery, deceptive, sneaky being. And don't you dare think you can outsmart him. Now, listen to me. He's been outsmarting people for several thousand years. Am I right? So you see, we need to be spiritually mature, not only because of the snake, Satan, the deceiver, but the Bible also, I don't have a picture of this, but he, he says he's also a what? A roaring lion seeking someone who he can devour. So again, so very critical here. So what I'm trying to tell you is do not underestimate the enemy. Don't you think that, oh, I'm so spiritually aloof now that, that he's not gonna tip me, my friend. Just remember Adam and Eve created innocence yielded to the temptation, see. Paul the apostle in Ephesians 6, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, what does it say there? The wiles, the schemes, the methodologies, the bait of Satan. You know, when I go fishing, I'll use one bait. If it doesn't work, I'll use another bait. I use some kind of a bait that's gonna attract the fish. He's got all kinds of methods. He's been using these things for thousands of years, as I already said. So you've got to be careful in this area. Watch this scripture here. Interesting. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven the one, notice for your sakes, in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his what? Do we ever think that unforgiveness can be used by the enemy to pull us down? Whoa. You see, all kinds of devices that he uses. Now, let me just go on very quickly here to, let me just go on to the next, another reason why we need to be spiritually mature because the need for godly living the need for godly living. Notice this next scripture. <clears throat> the Bible says, next one, I'm sorry. I skipped that one. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Watch this, training you. Training me to do what? Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age as we wait for that blessed hope, the appearing in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. We have the expectation God fills us with the Holy Spirit. You've got the Spirit of God living in you 24-7. He's there. Why? To help you live a godly, consecrated, sanctified life. So guys, there can't be any excuses is what I'm saying here. We need spiritual maturity there. Number four, a thriving church speaks the truth in love. That's what our major text said. Let me just go to that scripture and I'll just go to the bottom of that scripture. Notice, rather speaking the truth in love. Would you agree with me that some people don't want to hear the truth? I remember Jack Nicholson, who was playing in the firm with Tom Cruise. Pam, Pam thinks that Tom Cruise is the most handsome guy in the world. I mean, <laughs> but do you remember what he said? You, you don't want to know the truth. Remember that statement that he just kind of broke out and said, you can't handle the truth, right? Remember that? You see, some people don't want to know the truth because they can't handle the truth, because it challenges them. You listen to me. It challenges them to the core of their being. And how many of you know there is truth, by the way? Everything's not relative. You know, I, I held up something. I, I would, if I told you this was a canary, a yellow canary, what would you say? You would say, that's a lie. 
<laughs> That's false, right? Because there is truth. And the word of God is truth. So very critical. Truth in love. Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, notice, the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Paul writing to Timothy again says, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, which is, what does he say? It's the pillar and the ground of what? My friends, if we're not speaking the truth, who will? Do you understand what I'm saying? We are the pillar, we as a church. The church is in the building, it's the people, it's you, it's me, it's pastors and other believers in Christ. We are the pillar and the ground of truth. And so we have this incredible responsibility to speak the truth. Let me just mention a couple of things. Speak it firmly. Speak it firmly. You know, I've got the responsibility to speak it firmly, convincingly. You know, not waffling, well, I just don't know what to say. No, speak it firmly, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, you're called to speak it firmly in the day you live in. You say, well, they're going to get upset with me. Well, they got upset with Jesus. They got upset with the apostles. They got upset with the other disciples. They got upset with those who were martyred for their faith. Yeah, let them get upset. But they need to hear it. Speak it boldly. <laughs> Don't back up. You speak it firmly and you speak it boldly. When I say firmly, you speak it with conviction. And here's your conviction, the word of the living God. And then you speak it boldly, which means you got to speak it. You can't just, well, I'm just going to ignore what he said or she said. But then speak it compassionately. Speak the truth in love. So very critical. I'll be preaching on some issues next Sunday. Various issues. Uh, again, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I am going to tell you issues you should find out what your candidates believe. Amen. Amen. And, you know, none of them are perfect. I'm not talking about just the presidency. I'm talking about senators and congressmen, the whole, the whole scenario, local people. I think it's very critical. And I'll deal with, well, should the church say anything? Well, we'll deal with that next week too. And uh, lots of misinterpretations. I'm, I do not believe in Christian nationalism. For that, That's something they're, telling, they're trying to silence as well. You're a Christian nationalist. Gee, there's not going to be in Christian nationalism until Jesus comes. If you think the world's going to get more Christian, I mean, we've got another thing. <laughs> we ought to go get our theological heads examined. That's not going to happen. So, but, but I'll share more things about that next week. But lovingly, we, we, we preach firmly, boldly, lovingly. Number five, lastly, a thriving church understands the importance of the contribution of each member. Each member, the contribution. Notice he says, rather speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ with whom the whole body, watch this, joined together, held together by every joint which is equipped. That means every single one of you have a part to play in the body of Christ. Notice, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that the body builds itself in love. Now, I don't have time to read this, but in, go home and read 1 Corinthians 12, because what Paul does, he compares the, the church, the saints, the people of God, the body of Christ, to a human body, the eye, the ear, the mouth, the tongue, the foot. He says every single part is critical. Let me just show you some pictures of the body. Don't we have an amazing God, by the way? Look at this. this look at that picture of the body. All these different parts. You have arteries. You have veins. You have bones. You have muscles. Notice another picture here. Look at that. I mean, look, look, at, how, look at how incredible our God is. He created this body. I mean, we just kind of look in the mirror and say, hmm, okay, that's, we have no idea. What's, I mean, aren't you glad your skin's not see-through, by the way? Ooh. <laughs> But what Paul is doing is all these parts have a function. They work together. So we as a church, and this is why I'm trying to encourage you to get involved in a Sunday school class or a small group in the body of Christ because you have something to add, to strengthen, to bring edification to those inside that class as a church family to build a healthy church. Here's what I want to say. Everyone has a gift for the body. 
It may be, you, may, you know what your gift may be? You just got the most incredible smile. And when you greet people, they just feel loved and warmed by you. It may be passing out bulletins. You're good in hospitality. Maybe cooking. We've got a bunch of volunteers in the kitchen. Amen? You know, it may be teaching. It may be playing up here an instrument. It may be singing. All these other gifts in the body of Christ. It may be you're an intercessor, you're a prayer partner. Everyone ha- can do something in the body. Everybody can do something, say, within the body. And then lastly, everyone is significant to the body. Everyone. I showed you all those pictures and I'll close because when we all work together, look at this picture. Here's, here's what can happen. These guys, and from what I, I, I just kind of Googled in Canva, I went to Canva, I searched Amish because I know they build barns. Have you ever seen them? They all get behind a, one big, huge barn, walls going, they're all there. You know what they're doing? They're working together, every single one of them in unity to build that structure. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm just simply saying to you, when you and I get involved in a church, whether it's a Sunday school class, a small group, whatever it is, we are building, we're adding to it, we are contributing. It just may be your presence that encourages others, see, inside the body of Jesus. So for three weeks, oh, you're going to be in Sunday school for three weeks. Oh, good. I think we have some cordlies outside. Am I right, Shane? I, I don't know. They're out there? Okay. There's some cordlies at this end, on, and at this end. Get your cordly, a Sunday school cordly. If you don't have one, then just, just show up next week and they'll give you one. Where do I go? Well, just show up. We'll figure it out. You know, go to the Family Life Center. We'll have some people there to direct you, okay? And uh, go to this class, that class, and just talk to Pastor Shane and those who are there. But here's the key thing. This is all the body of Christ, but you're not a part of the body if you don't know Jesus. You can be religious, but if you don't know Jesus, you're not part of the body. Question, have you given your life to Christ? Not church membership, not baptism. Have you said yes to Jesus? I believe he died for me. He was buried. He was resurrected. Lord, I believe you died on that cross for my personal sins. Come into my life and save me. Listen, if you ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of all your sins, whether you ever come back here or not, he'll save you. He will change you. He will transform you. He will give you meaning. Amen, church. He will give you purpose in your life. And you will never be the same. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're a believer in Christ, and you need to recommit, recommit your life to Jesus. Or maybe you're here this morning, I'm challenging you to get involved in a class and get involved in some part of this body. Guys, I believe that we as a church family have the potential over the next several years to come to build one of the most amazing, exciting churches in this region. God has given us great property. He's given us a great location. But let me tell you, it's people. The church is the people, say. Would you stand with me? We're gonna pray. I'm gonna ask our prayer teams to come. If you've never given your life to Christ, I give you that invitation. If you need to recommit your life to Christ, that will be the decision. If you'd like to come, we have altars up here where you can kneel and pray. If you need prayer for healing, prayer for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, whatever the need is, I, I invite you to come. Let's pray together. Father, how we love you and we love the church. Lord, we wanna be the pillar and the ground of the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Father, we know that if we don't do it, nobody's gonna do it. So Lord, would you empower us? Lord, we, your people here at the Tabernacle Church, God, would you just so absolutely anoint us and fill us with the Holy Spirit to give us boldness and let us be courageous in the faith, be willing to speak up and stand out for the cause and the truth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Lord, if there's those today who need to walk down these aisles and give their life to Christ, may you, Lord, may they come. Lord, if there's those who need to recommit, may they come. Lord, those who need to come to the altar for prayer, they just, or Lord, they just need some encouragement today. They're overwhelmed with some issues that they are facing in life. 
God, you're the one who supplies all of our needs. May they come in Jesus' name. We're going to sing. This is for you. Once again, what an amazing word from our pastor. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this worship service today. God is so good. We believe that he is doing a mighty work in you today. And we hope that this word really set deep in your heart and in your spirit and really answered maybe some questions that you've been asking the Lord Jesus in this season. Hey, well, we don't want to waste a single moment that if today is the day that you would like to give your life to Jesus Christ, we invite you to say the simple prayer with us today. So join me now. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God sent to this earth. You died on the cross, and on the third day, you rose again to give me new life. I believe that I can give my life to you right in this moment and you will take me as your own and make me new again. I pray this in your blessed and beautiful name, Jesus. Amen. Well, we believe that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you've given your life to him in this moment right now, that you are born again and we want to celebrate you. So I invite you to go visit our website at tabsarasota.org. On our connection card right there on our website, you can just list that today you gave your life to Jesus. We want to know about it so that we can support your journey. Well, thanks again so much for joining us here at this beautiful Tabernacle Church online service, and we look forward to seeing you next week.